a Discipline and Behavior Module presentation by Susie, Marcy, and Nicole, uh, a finance and enrollment date update. Uh, we wanna just also say, I know that I've heard Paula say this, like everybody has been super, super responsive about getting data to us in a timely manner and uh, really thoughtful about making sure that we understand if there's an additional one-on-one -on -one or a new child who's coming into your SAU. So we just want to say it's um it's such a pleasure having everybody just be kind of very responsive to this process as we are doing this. And so I know that that's a big um, milestone that we we made it to the October 1st <laughs> um, child count. <clears throat> And that was just this week and uh, it, it went really well. So thank you for um, being very proactive and responsive and uh, we just appreciate that a lot. Okay, discipline and behavior, Susie, Marcy, and Nicole. You're on mute, Susie. I'm going to share my screen. Is that all right, Marcy and uh, Nicole? Marcy and Nicole are trying to unmute. I'm going to try to unmute you for you. Thanks, Aaron. I wasn't trying to unmute, but I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> it like it works. <laughs> okay, so we'll get started. Um, we uh, thought that we would do a quick presentation around some resources, tools, and information on uh, supporting challenging behaviors in early childhood settings. So this, we know the schools have been up and running for um, a number of weeks, and um, we are sure you've been encountering some um, behaviors and and in the programs and services that you've been offering to our preschool age children. So we thought we would just share with you a little bit of information um, that we have uh, that might be of help. So we always like to start off with why are we talking about this right now? And we wanted to um, acknowledge some of the challenges that teachers are experiencing right now. Um, and uh, we know that nationally that about 7% of the one and a half million preschoolers uh, that are children with IEPs um, are expelled or have been expelled at a much greater rate than their typical peers. And that comes from the 2017-18 civil rights data collection. Um, the Office of Special Education, which is our federal uh, program um, from the U.S. Department of Education, our special ed program side of things, um, has consistently talked to us about these the removals of preschool age children from the um, programs that they're enrolled in. And we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what that looks like in um, early childhood settings and uh, ways that we could appropriately respond to that to those behaviors. Um, in Maine, we have been fielding questions about um, addressing challenging behaviors in the classrooms and schools uh, have been reaching out and asking for some technical assistance about that. And so um, we have a few, uh, a little bit of information to share with you about that. And so, um, we know that this is something that schools experience um, with kids that are newly enrolled every year, and we want eventually to for programs to have to be able to anticipate these challenges, and we are prepared at the Department of Ed to help. So, yes, no. Want me to take it from here? Oh yeah. Oh Nicole, this yes. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah. So uh, like Susie said, this time of year is a really common time for uh, folks in our early learning team to start receiving outreach from schools with public pre-Ks 
specifically, um, but also children in, in the K-2 grades as well, who may be experiencing challenging behaviors in the classroom and, and the school and administration is seeking clarity, um, again, specifically to public pre-K around what is within their sort of realm of possibilities of what they can and cannot do in regards to um, including that child moving forward in, in the pre-K space. So I'm not going to read the slide word for word, but suffice it to say that once a public school determines that they're going to offer pre-K as a grade and enroll age eligible students in that grade and receive public funding <laughs> to support that grade, then all of the other regulations come into play. So it shouldn't be unfamiliar for folks in, in our public schools that are here today um, to be unaware of, for example, suspension and expulsion laws in, in the K-5 specifically, because that's the uh, primary and elementary world, but even beyond. So once you take pre-K on, those expulsion and suspension laws pertain to students in pre-K as well, meaning that if a child in our pre-K classroom is experiencing a, a difficult behavior, difficult transition, what have you, then asking them to leave or suspending them from attending or expelling them from the program altogether is not uh, not allowable. So it's going to border all, could border also on the line of discrimination. So rather than immediately going to uh, making a decision of this child can no longer attend for these hours or can no longer attend at all, we want to make sure that our teachers and our administrators have the resources and things that they need in place to support that child's attendance. Ultimately, by doing that, by, by potentially sending them home, we're not doing anybody any favors because in a few months, that child's likely going to enroll as a kindergarten student. And we all know that once they enroll as a kindergarten student, they're, they're welcome to attend and are afforded all of these rights. So we're not, by asking them not to return in pre-K, we're not providing them any resources or routines or daily schedules that are meant to support their development in a positive way. So we really can't be doing that. Um, and it's easier said than done. Marcy and I and our team are well aware that we can sit here and say, no, you cannot suspend or expel that pre-K student. But with that comes a lot of TA necessary and a lot of professional development potentially um, to support the child's uh, attendance to stay in a classroom that is inclusive. Um, above and beyond that, if the child that we're speaking of has an IEP or is in the referral process to receive an IEP potentially or an evaluation, then they are also afforded the rights under IDEA, which is federal law. So now we're you know bypassing state law altogether and bumping right up to federal law. So we really need to be aware of the importance of having a pre-K classroom and what that means for our staff and for our community, both the positive aspects of it but the lawful aspects as well. Um, so the regulations that are, are cited here are federal regulations as well as state statute. Um, I know many folks are also aware of chapter 33 restraint and seclusion that is present in public pre-K as soon as we have that. Um, so just wanting to make sure that folks um, are aware of that. Public pre-K is not immune to these rights and we don't want to just you know, say, Public pre-K is a voluntary grade for us to offer. Public pre-K is a voluntary grade for students to attend. Therefore, nothing applies. Um, that couldn't be further from the truth. So um, that's information that we share typically. And um, having the opportunity to share it in a group like this, I think, is really important. So we appreciate having to do that. Okay, so we thought we would include in here some definitions that come out of federal regulations and um, are probably ones that you're familiar with. And so um, suspension, in-school suspension, exclusionary discipline, um, what do we mean by a school day, disciplinary removals or changes in placement, informal removals, physical restraint, and short-term disciplinary removals uh, most of these are cited uh, in the IDEA regulations, um, but what we did want to share is that these are pretty formal federal um, definitions, but we know what this um, kind of translates into in terms of um, 
you know, children being removed from preschool programs. And so as we heard, the data says that it's happening often and it happens more often for preschool age children. So um, we wanted to bring to your attention what the specific definitions were of these various um, um, exclusionary uh, concepts in, uh, in IDEA. So that being said, we also wanted to share a little bit about how this could look in preschool programs. So we might not call it a suspension. Um, we probably wouldn't call it an informal removal, but um, I think that uh, Marcy and uh, Nicole have some you know, experience, a lot of experience with going into classrooms and talking with teachers and administrators and um, being familiar with how this looks in, in programs that they can share with us. Sure, and we really only know about them if they come to our attention. This isn't something that our team specifically collects data on or that we are specifically um, working to triage, so to speak. We have a lot of folks and experts at the department um, that we would collaborate very closely with. And in the event that a child's behavior rises to this level of um, you know, TA, we would certainly pull in our colleagues from the Office of School and Student Supports um, for their expertise and, and resources as well. So if, it, if anything like this comes to our attention, then Marcy and I are charged with collaborating with others at, in the field um, at, and at the department to make sure that we are able to provide the most specific uh, TA and, and resources to your particular situation. Um, but any of these big concepts and names, certainly I, I'm not naive enough to think that it's not happening in pre-K, right? Born yesterday. So uh, what we really wanna do is be proactive and get out ahead of it to make sure that folks are aware that um, these things exist, however, shouldn't exist in pre-K and what can we do to, to better support our, uh, our staff and, and the full inclusion of all the students. Um, so uh, we know that some districts may call these things different, right? So for example, a modified schedule, well, that's sort of like a, a in-school suspension maybe, it could also be called um, a suspension in general, but we don't like tying the word suspension to a four-year-old. So we'll call it something different, right? Well, it, it still is what it is. Um, again, that child uh, has every right to be in the, in the classroom. Um, and we also want to make sure above and beyond all communication that that is happening with the parent and in, involved. And it's certainly if there's an IEP team involved, then we want to make sure those professionals are included in all communication around the child's behavior and, and any concerns about their development um, so that decisions can be made as a team and not just unilaterally by the school. So in the event that a child's behavior rises to the level of danger to themselves or others, then certainly that's a conversation that needs to be had with the parent to determine the next best steps. And it might be that the parent says, you know, this full day program is just too much of a transition for my child right now. Can I pick them up at noon? Or can, or, you know, can we, can we modify their day? So with the parents' input and agreement, that's a conversation that can be had and potentially met to. We don't want it to be a long-term decision or, or remedy. We want to make sure that we're talking about the goals of this child transitioning into the full to access fully the program. Um, but what we don't want is schools unilaterally making a decision about a child's ability to attend. Um, and, and certainly we don't want to expel them. In, in the event that something rises to the level of expulsion, then theoretically, it, written in law, that child would need to follow all of the expulsion steps that are written into your school board's policy. Um, and in my local school board, that means that that four-year-old would need to show up to the, to meet with the school board folks and talk about... <laughs> talk about why they're there, which is just, you know, vehemently inappropriate for four year olds to ever have to go through something like that, of course. That goes without saying. So we want to be proactive. We want to avoid these things and we want to make sure we're calling it what it is, a modified schedule, suspension and explosion, et cetera. Uh, we need to be really careful when thinking about that as a potential um, disciplinary action for, for a four year old's behavior in class. I'm taking right. a look. No, that's okay. I just want to add one other thought to that that we don't see very often, but I, I have in my past couple of years, if not for that um, Herder scene, is if you don't have, if you have unavailable services or staffing for a child, um, sorry, the light's just going off. 
<laughs> we'll get off the move. It's all good. Um, for a student to receive services that might need sort of one on one support or specially designed instruction or something to help them get through the school day. It's also considered expulsion if you tell that child or that family that child cannot come until you have that person in place. So while you're hiring somebody or looking for staffing to fill those services, you still need to provide programming for that child and have a plan in place that includes that child in the classroom. We understand right. how challenging that is, um, especially um, with staffing shortages as being what they are. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, so that we can potentially find supports for you or consultation or anything we can to support. Um, and we can think creatively and outside the box too, working with CDS resources. So just if you get into that position, please do call us so that we can help you. Um, I think it's really clear that, you know, um, this is the issue in Maine is really highly focused into by the federal government right now that we have something called an abbreviated day, which is not legal and certainly um, not advisable to use uh, disrupting children's programming like that. So they're kind of keenly focused in on that area. So are our um, constituents and advocates. I do wanna tell you that I met with the Iris Center today and I'm just gonna drop their link into the chat because they have free um, programming for early intervention behavior and classroom management practices that um, your folks, your ed techs, anyone in your school can get contact hours towards certification for free. So I'm just gonna drop that resource in because the best um, thing that we can do is have really good prevention for some of these things from happening. Thank you, Erin. So finally, to summarize, um, for publicly funded students with and without disabilities, regardless of the environment or setting that they're in, they have protections against removals, suspensions, and expulsions. And those include, you know, IEP meetings that would um, ask and expect that any change in placement be um, um, referenced in the IEP and ag agreed to by the IEP team. So let's talk a little bit about um, what this looks like and how these behaviors um, are seen uh, in schools. Okay, so the thing about challenging behaviors is that there's always, with, with young children, there's always a reason for them. Behaviors in young children are actually coming, they're a form of communication. They don't know how to self-regulate. They do not have executive functioning skills. They don't have the social emotional skills. All of those foundations of learning is kind of what our focus is zero to five. Um, and so it's important to understand that because a child is having challenging behaviors, well, there's a bunch of things to understand, but while they may be triggering, triggering and challenging to the adult in the classroom, they may also be developmentally appropriate. So when we're looking at development of children, we're looking specifically right now at three and four-year-olds and not completely three and four-year-olds with IEPs or qualified for services, but all three and four-year-olds because children develop at a different rate. Everybody develops differently. Um, so when you look at a child who may be um, displaying inappropriate or challenging behaviors in the classroom, such as hitting or rolling around at large group and you know they can't keep their hands and their feet to themselves, throwing toys or taking toys from others, there's a host of reasons why that could happen. Um, it could be that the child has had, not had experience in a classroom or program before. It could be that the child does have a developmental delay whether it's whether they need to be referred or qualified, that's or qualified for services that's dependent on the evaluation, right? Um, but there, but again, it's it's a lot of it is just age appropriate. Three year olds and four year olds don't innately know how to share toys. They do not know how to sit for five minutes with their hands in their lap, listening to a story at circle with a with sixteen other children of their age, because they haven't been taught yet. Um, so what's really important to remember is that. The job in pre-K is actually teaching those skills because just like reading, writing, um, all of the other skills that we teach children, the foundations of social emotional learning, self-regulation, executive functioning, those skills that children need in order to be able to sit and attend and engage and, and understand sort of how to be part of 
a positive part of that classroom community, those are what we're teaching them in pre-K, preschool. Um, trauma is another big experience that should definitely not be overlooked. There are things that can happen, you know, in the morning while a child's getting ready to come to school. Maybe they stub their toe. I mean, it could be as easy as that. Maybe they have a family member who's, who's you know, really ill or in the hospital or incarcerated or just a host of different things because essentially what we need to remember is that all of the children who come into our classrooms all have different backgrounds, different experiences, different opportunities, um, different, you know, different things that are happening in their life that we may not always know. Um, there's a number of different ways to remedy that, but we'll we'll stick to challenging behaviors today. This is a, it's a really, really big topic. So this is like a really small nutshell. Um, we actually do a lot of, you know, two, two and a half hour trainings focused on challenging behaviors and building relationships with families and community providers so that we can support those children and families to sort of help those, um, help learning those skills as early as we can. Um, let's see, the other thing to really be considerate of is that while some challenging behaviors, such as a child who has a, uh, a, a significant speech delay may have a hard time communicating, may get frustrated when his friends or his teachers don't understand what he's asking for and may hit and spit and throw things and have it, you know, be tantruming. That's normal for that child because they're, they're frustrated. They can't communicate. Nobody understands them. That child would definitely warrant uh, a referral evaluations, possibly qualify for IEP services. But by and large, a lot of children who do um, display challenging behaviors in a early childhood classroom actually will not qualify. Referrals are always great because you actually never know until you do evaluations. So we let the, um, the experienced people who can focus on that do those evaluations and then maybe they qualify, maybe they don't. Because like we said before, children develop on a continuum and they don't all do, do it at the same time. So one child might be, you know, my son was walking when he was nine months old. My daughter was 15 months old. Um, my daughter started talking like a five-year-old when she was 14 months old. My son was like two and a half or three and he was in speech services because he had a severe articulation concern. All developed differently. Um, we have at the state of Maine, a preschool Maine early learning and development standard document and an infant toddler early learning and development standard document. Um, bring those up because those are our developmental continuums that we use here in the state of Maine. Those documents starting at birth are aligned birth through five. The IT is birth through three and then the preschool melt is three to five year and then they're aligned to the moon learning results starting in kindergarten as well, broken down by age. But what's important to remember is that the physical age of a child or the calendar age of a child may not be the developmental age. So when you're looking through those, you can sort of look to see what um, what area of development the child is at and then match that to the age that they are. So when you have a child who you know does need speech services or does have an OT delay or a PT delay, a physical delay, something like that, they may actually, they may be three and a half years old, but they may present as an 18 month old. Um, and there's a number of different reasons we won't get into why that can happen. But knowing that can happen when you look, when you're using these documents, you can sort of track their development and say, okay, this is where they are at 18 months. So what is the next step? What is the next, you know, developmental growth that we need to be looking at? These documents will help you find that and then help you build individual um, activities and learning instruction for to help that child meet their next goals and their next steps. Um, this is by no means an assessment tool, and it's not a curriculum also. It's it's a developmental continuum that helps you track and figure out where your children are and what their next goals in development and learning are. Um, what I also want to point out is the PMLs was actually just updated, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2000, uh, earlier this year, actually. So one of those links actually goes to just a newsroom article so you can get a little background on it, and then there are um, links both to the PMLs and the IT notes. And if you would like those in paper copy, we do have printed ones that we can get to you. Great. Thank you. Yes. So we also compiled um, a number of resources and different approaches to supporting classrooms, teachers, children, and families um, in sort of working on the social emotional learning and um, development of children. The first one, and there are no particular order. A lot of these are actually, uh, most, 
well, pretty much all of these are actually in our state, which is kind of cool. But the first one is the Maine Early Childhood Consultation Partnership. Um, this is a program that actually has one, if not two, one consultant, if not two in every county in our state. And you can go on their website and fill out an information form. They do classroom support specific to classroom management and positive climate using a specific observation tool in the classroom. And they also do targeted support for specific children working with families and classroom teachers. Um, it is a no cost program. The University of Quality is our Early Childhood Professional Development Network. If you have pre-K in your in your school, your pre-K teacher and ed tech and any staff are actually required by Chapter 124 to be registered with Main Roads to Quality. Um, it's sort of where you can house all of your um, professional development pieces that you've done, but they also offer a number of uh, trainings and different courses. Um, they have one that's positive behaviors and positive supports for challenging behaviors. They do the Main Roads, uh, you know, it's the Main Early Learning and Development Standards for Pre-K and Infant Toddler as a course to go through that. Um, they also have an inclusion course and book study and a, a, num a host of other, they, they focus on childcare as well. So it's not just public pre-K, but it's um, a host of other opportunities. Um, building relationships with families is another one that's actually coming up pretty soon. The Main Roads to Quality Warm Line, Main Roads to Quality is the professional development network. The Warm Line is actually a support where you can call um, and they actually will come and say, like, it's just very, it, it's some, it's very um, supporting in the classroom. So they'll work with teachers and they'll work with classroom environments and they'll help uh, support children and, and teachers in the classroom. Um, the Main Resilience Building Network or MERBIN is um, just what it says. They're working on building resilience with um, essentially right now the fall, and winter learning opportunities are helping adults in the classroom work with children and themselves in building resilience. Uh, and those are some really opp great opportunities that also are of no cost. The pyramid model is building foundational social emotional competencies in children. It's actually an early childhood MTSS model, so multi-tiered systems and support. It has three levels. The first one essentially being a really strong workforce and program. The middle one is those tier two kids who needed a few extra supports and the top is the tier three children, maybe one or two in your class at that, that might need intensive supports, possible referrals, but not always. Um, Pyramid model is been around for a long time. Head Start uses that model pretty frequently, frequently across the nation. And it also can, it's really great when you use it on sort of like a program level and not just across the classroom level, but they have a lot of information training. They also have a lot of social stories, um, tips for teachers, tips for parents. There's a ton of information on that site. Leading Early Learning Pre-K to Third Grade Program is a program that we are actually kicking off today, right downstairs. Um, it is for leadership and, and essentially um, early childhood teachers in public schools. And essentially, it's it's a five month long cohort that is focused on early learning, which is pre K to third grade in this in this case. So it focuses on child development. We look at play in the classroom. We look at best practice um, and a whole host of other things. Uh, the next cohort will actually not start until next October, and information will come out about that late spring. And then the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies (CCIDS) is a University of Maine program, and the reason I put this on here, they have obviously a ton of research, if that's your jam, which I love reading the research. They also have, and the, the second um, link is to um, growing ideas and resources, so it's tip sheets for teachers and families, and those are their social emotional learning and, and um, uh, some like specific to child development in three different areas. And they have some really amazing tips for teachers and parents to share. And that's really, I mean, it's the tip of the iceberg because there's so many resources out there, but these are pretty much the local ones. We also have, <laughs> deep breath, I'm almost dead. We also have a lot of professional development um, that's coming up from the early learning team. And so I just wanna talk about that real quick, but we do pre-K for me, K for me, and first grade for me as instructional programming. You can find links on our early learning website and we do monthly PLC as they started yesterday, but it's, you can, teachers can come if they wanna come and don't come if they can't, and that's perfectly fine. Um, we are doing a challenging behavior and early childhood environment learning module that's actually starting on October 29th. It's going to be sort of a 
starting the virtual meeting and then sort of be an asynchronous on your own modules. And those are actually based off two of the IRIS modules on um, teaching rules and expectations in the classroom and building positive early childhood environments. Because like Aaron said, the IRIS modules are, um, which is actually next on the list, but they're phenomenal. And it's they have a lot about early childhood, but they actually do early childhood all the way up. And it's a lot of special education focus, um, writing IEPs. There's there's so much there. So I would, I would highly recommend checking that out. We do an upcoming book study focused on classroom management uh, strategies and behavior as communication. That's not going to start until probably January, but I wanted to throw that on here. And then our newsletter has all of our offerings as they come and go and offerings across the state. And then we do also offer monthly office hours that's every second Thursday of the month, starting next Thursday from 3.30 to 4.30. And that link will bring you to information on all of those things. And then finally, we have some local contacts if you have uh, need for assistance or want more information. Um, Andrew Logan is our multi-tier systems of support specialist. I am Marcy and I am the public pre-K <laughs> public pre-K consultant um, and can offer some pre-K gen ed support and other different topics. Tracy Whitlock is our PBIS support specialist. And then Bear Shea, who I think is here somewhere, um, he would be able to help on chapter 33 and other social emotional supports. And then if you have any other questions um, for cohort as cohort one um, SAU, you can to uh, give those to Jen Hopkins. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Great. I know it's a lot of information and we throw a lot of resources out for you. Out for you. Um, and so again, please do contact us if you need some problem solving thought partners and some resources headed your way, we can, we can help you out. Um, I'm so happy to hear that you knew about those iris modules, Marcy, because I was like, where have I been since they're amazing and they have contact hours. So you can use them for ed techs. You can use them for professional development training. If you don't have time to provide your professional development training, you can just, uh, focus people in that direction. Okay. And next on the agenda is Kathy Warren. Okay, it is not, I am, I'm kind of sort of next on the agenda. Allie Cookson is going to be presenting information on um, the finance spreadsheet that we are using for the collection of kids that you are enrolling. So I will pass it over to Allie. Thanks, Kathy. I'm just going to share my screen really quick. I don't know if I have the, oh, there it is. Okay, now, we're good. Okay. No pressure, Ellie. I know. I'm trying to get it set up. I was no worries. There we go. Okay. Whew. Thanks, Kathy, for that long introduction. <laughs> like, plenty of time to do. I, I could have done better with that one, <laughs> couldn't I? Um, okay. So this is just a really brief overview of what the um, report is going to look like um, and where the data can come from in your um, uh, template that was sent out. So in October 1 enrollment, there is a count summary details report that can help you with filling out the template that uh, was sent out, I believe, last week. Um, so the count summary details report is going to have your attending district. It's going to have your resident district, all the information that you need in order to pull it onto that other report um, to send over to, um, is, who is that going to, Kathy? Going to Paula. Going to Paula. So this is for Paula. Actually, um, sorry, it is ultimately going to Paula. They are being sent to Jen Hopkins. Okay, that was what I was wondering. <clears throat> yep. I just wanted Absolutely. to be sure. Sorry. Okay. Paula so is they the final recipient. Yes. So these are going to Jen Hopkins, and then they will be going to Paula. 
Um, so if you have not yet filled this information out, um, and this is probably really hard to see, but I can make it maybe make it bigger so it's easier. Zoom it in. Um, I don't know if that's making any difference for anyone. Um, this information is information that comes directly from State Synergy. So this is based off of students who have enrollments in State Synergy. Um, so if information needs to be entered there. And then the hourly ECL needs to run before this report will populate. And I believe this morning we had most of our students in there ready to go. So most SAUs that are participating in cohort one, you should see your students listed in your count summary detail report in order to fill out your template that needs to be sent to Jen. So this is what you would see. This is all the information that you would have. You can save this information. You can search for particular students. You're going to see all of your students listed here, uh, but you can filter to grade level or you can export to specifically um, just pre-K. Um, exporting will give you more filtering ability if you wanted to do that. But just keep in mind that if you do export the report, any changes that take place in Synergy will not be reflected on that downloaded report. You'll have to go back into NEO, to student data, to find that information. So this is a little bit chaotic, uh, but I did want to give everybody just kind of where the information is going on the um, completing the template. So I apologize for all my arrows, but I promise it makes sense. And we're going to go really slow through this part, um, or maybe kind of slow. Attending district. From that um, count details report, you have attending district available right there for you. Um, so you would find your student and then you would fill this information in here based on what's in that account summary report. Same with resident district. So that's going to be available there. Uh, resident town, again, you would just match your student, pull that information into the template. Um, Superintendence agreement, you do need to have a formal superintendence agreement and that superintendence, superintendence agreement needs to be sent to Jen as well. Uh, you will see that on the fiscal responsibility if a student qualifies as superintendence agreement that will come from their fiscal responsibility. Um, so we'll just transfer over to that column, yes or no. Um, then you have last name, first name, state student ID number, again, that's generated from Synergy. So we want to make sure sometimes our local student information systems have different ID numbers than our state student ID numbers. So we want to make sure we're pulling this from the report in NEO. Um, sex, birth date, and then you'll have age as of October 1. So you don't have to do the math. We will do the math for you. And grade should be pre-K. And again, that res uh, fiscal responsibility there. Allie, can I... Can I add in here too, if you have, so you have all previously sent lists to Jen of the students that you anticipated having enrolled in the program this year that were used for the funding that's already been sent. If there are kids on that list that you have not yet put into Synergy for enrollment and you aren't sure how to do them and have a have a question about them, I'm anticipating that that most of you have probably already, most of your business managers or data specialists have already had a conversation with Kim Hall about particular children you may have a question about but if you have some a child that's on that list and you have a question about how they need to be entered into synergy put them on the spreadsheet anyway and send that to jen because we need to get these numbers to paula so that we can generate funding we are doing a reconciliation reconciliation here um, between the students that are on your list and the students that we have enrolled in the system and we will be back in touch with you about any differences that are there. Uh, Kim's been doing some of that this week anyway, so y'all may have those conversations in process, um, but we will be, we'll be back in touch. And in terms of reconciliation, one of the reasons that we're directing you towards the report that's in the October 1 enrollment is because um, in order to really clearly make that reconciliation, we need like the names need to be the same and things like that. So just making sure that everything is consistent with what we see versus what's submitted is really important. The last two columns that I did want to hit on here um, are the child find yes or no column and then the parent, uh, parental consent. That information needs to be um, sent to Jen Hopkins. Um, so please make sure that you're doing that. So um, yep. 
you should only be selecting yes in your um, child find if you have a referral for evaluation and parental consent. So. Um, just as a note, Joe, I'm actually responding to your question in the chat, but so that other people know too, we are setting up like individual district questions. So I had, Joe, I have your email that you sent today and we'll put together the answers um, for the questions that you asked and then set up an opportunity for all of us to be in the same room that have the answers um, so that we can address your specific questions. Some of them may be specifically like, the most important thing is to get the kids in the Excel spreadsheet that you have previously told Jen in your earlier spreadsheet um, that you are enrolling if those kids are still there or with any changes that have happened since you put that list in. Get that to us and then we'll work on the reconciliation individually with you if there are still some questions. I think that's all we have. Kathy, unless Paula or Kim have something else to add? Paula, do you want to yeah, I'm just going to remind people because I think there still might be some confusion. Um, these students are completely separate from normal counts related to EPS funding. These are the even though we're using Synergy to collect information, they are completely separate from EPS calculation and from ED279 calculation. Uh, and I don't even know what attendance rates are, but I'm assuming it's separate from that as well. So this is a completely separate program. And so I, I need to, uh, uh, please don't be afraid of how this is going to impact normal operating procedures because uh, this is completely separate. There is no local funding. This is a calculation that is paid out four times a year separately from all of that. Uh, and Joe, there's a little more time, so relax. Uh, the payments go out on the 15th because we are doing quarterly payments. This is separate from EPS. That's why there's a short window for for up updating counts. So I promise you, we we will we will work with you to make sure the funding gets to where it needs to be. We just need your help getting all the counts. Joe, to to not go by your question about three year olds, um, I. Three-year-olds are included. I don't know if somebody from the from the Aussie team wants to address the parameters of that. Um, it also, I know Joe's got a bunch of other questions related to that that are in his earlier email. And so while we can address it here, if it's something others have questions about, it might be better to do in a specific district conversation. Erin, I'm going to defer to you on. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm assuming you're wondering if the three-year-olds are in the enrollment count, if they are identified or in child sign, and remember that marker is that they have to have a signed consent for evaluation, then they will be in your count. Only children in th who are three in special education or in child find. Does that answer your question, Joe? Again, this is, this is, this is a specific program taking over FAPE and CDS resp responsibilities from CDS for three, four, or five-year-olds enrolled in pre-K with an IEP, period. Child find is those that haven't been evaluated yet. There's a certain amount for that. Once they're evaluated, if it's an IEP, they get funded in this way. Yes, that's why we need the spreadsheet too. <laughs> Yes, the, uh, the funding is it, energy, it, right? it gets updated every quarter because we're we're paying you every quarter for those that at, get added to the counts within that quarter. So there's a July one count, there's an October one count, then there's a January one count, and then there's an April one count for this program. Three, four, five year olds enrolled in a pre K program with an IEP. Your other pre K students are regular funding not part of this conversation so one of the questions that we do have outstanding and Aaron this question is outstanding with Sandy so I don't expect that we can answer it right this minute but for kids that are in child find our three or almost three are receiving services and may have an IFSP 
but also may not. We have a couple of those instances, and it is not clear to us whether or not what the whether they're child fine kids or whether they're fully funded kids. Okay. Um, if the presence I can of the answer ISSC that, matters. Kathy. Okay. I can answer that. So um, we gave you training on the C to B transition. You're going to know this like the back of your hand after this year is over. But um, at the C to B transition conference, which takes place between 2.6 and 2.9 months old, that is when, and by the way, we're doing a training on this at MADSEC tomorrow, for those of you who are going to MADSEC. In between those three months, we have a transition conference. We look and evaluate, do we have all of the information we need to identify this child with a suspected disability right now under the category of developmental delay? If yes, you would um, create the IEP. But as soon as you have that transition conference, the child find responsibility shifts to the SAU. So you may find a child eligible with the information that you have, but suspect there might be another disability. So you would potentially order some okay. new evaluations. Um, um, I have a conference right now. Oh, sorry, Susie, I'm gonna mute you. Sorry. I can't sorry. mute you like that. Yep. <laughs> so um, I lost track of my thought there. Um, so. That transition is where you kind of take over. It's the first time there's a written notice, for instance. Those of you in special ed will know that is the legal document that articulates the intention of the IEP team. So that is where your responsibility comes in for child find. However, um, if you need additional information, um, you may have to get evaluation signed. Those evaluations, um, we're going to do some training on what and how and kind of how to do those evaluations. But yeah, that's when the transition happens. So it could be that at that transition conference, you have everything you need to qualify that child, even in the event that you need additional evaluations. And then that's your child find. You have that count. If the child doesn't qualify under developmental delay, but you suspect there's a disability and you have to do a, a different evaluation, that would be the same as the um, the child who's in child find who has a parental consent. So in special, for those of you who are um, the special directors on this call, you have to think of it like, you know, yes, we know this child qualifies, but do we need additional data? If we know they qualify already, then they're in our count. And if we don't have an, we don't have the information we need to qualify but we suspect a disability, we're gonna sign off on that and that's gonna trigger the $1,000 that you're going to get for child fine for the evaluation. Is that clear, Ms. Mudd? Go ahead, Kathy. Oh, you're muted. Kathy, you're muted, okay. Kathy Bielman asked about attendance. Um, we will, talk more about attendance and do another updated in future one of these meetings. Because uh, I have some questions about attendance myself that we have not, um, once again, Megan's usual, we're flying the plane um, comment. We need to clarify some of the reporting that we are or aren't expecting in house. So yeah, Kathy? You're still muted too. It's a disease we have. Um, just quickly, not to take people's time. So I, I have, I have an administrative assistant who we have two kids on synergy and they're not moving forward till I have an answer. So I'm trying to find out what if, do I tell this person to um, put this kiddo on, give them an ID. We want the attendance is an issue. We, it's a different place, but we have a lot of questions. So um, I have a spreadsheet that's not filled because I don't have an ID number for this child at this point. So that's okay. what I'm looking at right now. So if if this is a pre-K kid with an IEP, put them on the spreadsheet and get us okay. the information. Oh, you guys, can, yes. Okay. Okay. Just get that in and we will circle up through the outreach that Kim and Allie are doing and okay. through this meeting as well with instructions about attendance. Everybody's okay. going to need that. Tell your secretary we're trustworthy. We are. Um, okay. Perfect. <laughs> we will get I, 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 have, I have another out. source too. I would thank you. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Okay. If we don't get the spreadsheet, you will not get the funding. We need the spreadsheet with all the counts that you are responsible for so we can get you the funding by the 15th. We are we massively respectful of your of your secretary wanting to hold the line 
And normally we would be the person, the people telling her to do that um, as far as the attendance collection information goes. So we'll get that information to you. She's on the right track, but we need to get you, need to get you your dollars. Renee has a question. Thank you. So just to make sure that I am on the right page with, I have a part C to B child who will be three in November. Do I include him on this count? We've already had the meeting, developed the IAP. We've done all those things. So he goes here. Thank you. And congratulations, Renee, for attending your first transition conference. <laughs> Bet it was eye-opening. <laughs> Um, Aaron, can I clarify with Beth? Beth, are you looking for a meeting primarily about data entry or do you have program questions? Uh, data entry and reconciliation of children who didn't fit the the codes that were given. So we've it, it's it's just nebulous enough that I don't want to make an error okay. in our accounts. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll also I also represent Kittery too. Okay. So and they're doing things differently there and i i think that yeah i definitely okay. would like a meeting just to make sure that we've we've got all the information but i don't know that it's been entered correctly okay one of the things if you think you've got all the kids in it you might might want to default to sending it to us and kim is reviewing all of those and and reconciling them if we have questions we're going to come back to you and you can send us another one but if we've got it we at least know what you think you're working with so um Kim, I'll leave that to you, whether or not that was, presuming that was a good instruction. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that, Kathy, because I just assumed it was with me and Sandy and Jen. Yeah, so. no, it is weeds yeah. that you are not interested in. Um, one of the other um, questions, though, that I will throw out here that came up today, or that came up last week, actually, is we had had a question from a district about whether or not kids in this program um, needed immunizations the same way that kids in regular school did. And we have checked with Emily Poland, who's our school nurse director here, um, and confirmed also with Sandy Flack that it's her understanding. And I see Erin nodding. So yes, um, it is. Uh, there is no difference. There yeah. was some confusion because there was one year where um, there was an exception for children with an IEP, and that is um, no longer the case. So, and that's, there's no special collection location for that. It's the same collection process that you have for the rest of your kids, but these kids should be in that group. So, and if anybody's got any questions about that, also like send them along. Um, we can deal with specifics on the back side. Go ahead, Beth. Sorry, I always seem to be the one that unmutes at the end of these meetings. <laughs> so I think that the challenge just evolving over the last couple of weeks since we found out that they needed to be in our system it really falls in the category of children who don't attend our public pre-Ks. So those are our kids that are in satellite sites. And we will be able to gather all that information, but we really didn't have time to reach out to families in a very confusing way to say, hey, you need to register your kids today. That should have probably come when CDS sent the letters to the families, letting them know that the local districts were cohort one. There should have been a note in that letter that said you need to register your kids in the town of whatever it is. So, so we've gone ahead and registered these kids for the parents, but certain documents like vaccinations, we can get that. But for the purpose of child count, we just really need to know. And I know that Paula helped out with this last week when the conversation came up and we have the spreadsheet. But I think when we start talking about all of the components of registration, like proof of residency and immunization and everything else, what do we, what's the bare minimum that we need to get by on for child count so that we don't jeopardize the structures that we've established in our district? They're pre-K, they have an IEP and you're responsible for them in your district. But for the child count, the registration process. We in other words, the enrollment, all of those things aren't, you know, you have a spreadsheet to delineate how many children you're working with on IEPs for each of your SAUs. And it doesn't matter where you are in the enrollment process or where you're doing with that right now. If they're, um, not, in do, if they're not in Synergy yet, send them to us without the state ID. No, we've gonna... put them all into Synergy and we're getting feedback through our data manager on the Synergy process. So she's... And, and I know the same thing is happening with Kittery. So I think we've got two tandem things happening 
and even just now as I was sitting here, I was confused by the spreadsheet being brought up again because I thought if we were able to get everything into Synergy that we were cleared. And there's, so we've all been working double time trying to get this information. Yeah. So I think, um, Kim, we may want to get Kittery and York in the room together. I know Kim's been talking with both of your, both of your data people. Um, so let's just, let's get together and clarify with everybody in the same room, just in your specific situation. Because I think you may be all set and it may just, I may just be saying it slightly different or something. Um, However, Beth, thank you for bringing up the enrollment piece in the communication that we need to add that to it. That is very helpful. And I think um, we can, we have a lot of site directors right now on the call. We're planning on doing some public outreach for parent groups who are going to be involved in this process but we can also add it to the documentation samples that we already have for um, future. So great point. We want to acknowledge that. Thank you. I see, Lou, I see your hand up and I also see Paula making a face. Let me just check if the face that Paula is making is relevant to the conversation we just The face made. has to do with what was just commented on that if they didn't think they had to do the spreadsheet, if Synergy was up to date, the spreadsheet has to be done. Synergy is secondary. Synergy should be done, but spreadsheet is key to get the counts to us for the funding for this program. We are taking responsibility as the data team to circle back with you on any differences and make sure that you have the answers that you need for whatever needs to happen. In we, we cannot pull counts for this out of Synergy right now. We're not, we're not set up for it. Thank we're going to be, yeah, but, so we need the spreadsheet. We got your back. We're reconciling the two. Yeah, so we'll we'll meet with you, York and Kittery, on um, at some point in the very near future Kim, to help support that. Erin, Kim's been talking to both of their data people like all week, so let's leave it to her to circle up with them, and they can make sure amongst themselves who needs to be in the room to do that. But I think that one might be closer to close than we think it is. Um, unless Beth, Beth may have some other things I haven't heard about today, but I know from a data standpoint, I think Kim got to some resolution. Now I want to stop ignoring Lou. Lou. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Lou. I'm always on mute. <laughs> just uh, just a real clarification, a quick one. Uh, superintendents are constantly on the residency checks throughout the year, and they're following up with their school nurses by January and February on kids who have no proof of vaccination. So that's different than including them in child count. That process takes place really the first seven, eight months of school, sometimes as late as April. So two different things. Um, but if it turns out they're not a resident, then there will be an issue. But that's really probably way down the road. Make sense? Okay. Yep. And there's a question in the chat about the spreadsheet. Yes. So deadlines. And let me just clarify deadlines. that. The spreadsheet deadline is Friday, uh, or whenever Paula said it was. It's Monday. It's the 7th. Um, the spreadsheet deadline is the 7th. We will work with, there is not like a drop dead deadline for Synergy. We want to get Synergy in reconciliation with your spreadsheet that you've submitted for funding as soon as we can. So we will work with all of the districts individually keep pointing at Kim Hall here on the on the screen, but she is your lady and she is getting, um, she is working with the districts individually to make sure that your funding spreadsheet is reconciled to your synergy enrollments. So there isn't a fixed deadline there. We're not gonna let you wait until forever, but we do recognize that there are some individual students that may have a special situation that might be a little bit difficult to put in synergy. And Kim is in charge of working out all of those um, questions. So this is another point where we thank you for being part of cohort one uh, because you're helping us find all of those places where we need a new answer to a new question. And the cohort two folks, thank you ahead of time. Allie Cookson, I see your hand. Yeah, I just want to clarify one thing that Kathy just said is oh. that the synergy, um, so cohort one enrollments in synergy, there is no drop dead due date. Well, but so technically it's October 30th, enrollment. but the reason why I said there's no due date is because we, it, it is our full intention to get you finished before then. So yes, we want it done by your normal October count date, but don't yeah. focus on that because we are going to be working with you to get these pre-K kids settled in synergy as soon as possible after Paula has her spreadsheet on the 7th. 
or before the seventh. Please don't hold on to them to the set until the seventh, unless you have real questions that you don't need us to help you with, um, because we need to get. We are trying to get Paula her final finals like by the eighth. So we need to know what your questions are. So get us your spreadsheets, put a big flashing yellow sign on them if there's some kid that's the situation we need to talk about. Paula, was that serious enough? Paula's like, don't tell them they can put it off. So all right. I just need to, EPS is completely different. Yeah, that's due October 30, but this is not EPS. These students are not EPS. So service provider location. Um, so on Paula's spreadsheet, there is a place for service provider location and FAPE location. If your child is receiving services, for instance, so what we don't know for sure, um, and the special ed program people may know this, but the data people don't know this. So this is why we're asking for both things. If you have a child who's receiving speech and language, for instance, at a CDS site, but they're receiving their instruction at the local pre-K, like either in the public school or somewhere else, if that situation exists, we have to see it. So if services are being provided in the same location that FAPE is being provided, just put the same thing in both spots. But if there's a difference or if services are being provided, but they've opted out of preschool and there's not instruction happening somewhere, leave it blank. We need to know when those situations exist um, so that we can respond to them appropriately, coding wise. And don't worry about whether your answer is like the standard answer for the service provider location. We're still getting a handle on what all the possibilities are. We think we know, but we're looking for your information to help us validate that. All right, everybody, we are over time right now by two minutes. So um, we will say goodbye to you now and see you next week. Please don't hesitate to uh, reach out and we'll send you the resources that we provided from this meeting. Thank you all and have a great week.